Hello and welcome to this, our sixth quarantine special. This time we're going to be talking about two things which are very often missing when the subject of the First World War comes up in the media, on the news or in articles or, uh, or, or in documentaries and things like that. And those two things are context and perspective. So right at the start, um, let's wind back to the beginning of the centenary. Um, before the centenary had even started, uh, the, the, the mantra was very much that we were allowed to commemorate the First World War, but we weren't allowed to celebrate it. Well, I can certainly think of a few old veterans who would very much have celebrated the First World War and certainly the end of it if they'd still been with us. Um, but I can remember being at an event in Norfolk in, in 2014, uh, commemorating the start of the war, and being told by a member of parliament that the thing that, uh, you know, the thing you need to remember, Taff, is that the Second World War was a war of liberation. And I sort of looked at him and thought, uh, but the First World War was pretty much fought uh, on the same battlefield against pretty much the same enemy. And certainly the, the French and the Belgian people need to be liberated too. And there's a very real issue here, which crops up time and time again, um, most of which is simply down to the fact that people just don't understand the history. And, uh, and I think that that's something that, uh, that, that's, that's a real problem for anybody studying the war, to, to, to actually get their head around the fact and look at the real history behind it, rather than the sort of almost cartoon version that's grown up around it. For instance, um, every single time that the First World War is mentioned on the BBC News, the words horror or slaughter, or very often both, will be in the first sentence. And that doesn't make any difference whether the story that they're covering is a story about a horrific battle, or whether it's a story of a, a cute little teddy bear that a soldier found in the rubble and brought home and gave to his daughter. But the same isn't said of battles of the Second World War. And it's those little things, it's those little continuous drip feeding of, of distorted narrative which really don't help anybody who's trying to actually get to, uh, to, to have a proper understanding or teach other people about the First World War. Back in 2014, as I said, uh, an MP said to me that the, that the First World War uh, couldn't be celebrated, it had to be commemorated, and yet for the 75th anniversary of the Dambusters raid, you know, there were plenty of bits of footage on the television of, uh, of a Lancaster flying low over the... Uh, uh, over Cumbria and, uh, and, and slowly crawling up behind the band of the Royal Air Force at Scampton. It was clearly a celebration, a celebration of a great achievement. But never mind all those tens of thousands of people who died in the Ruhr Valley who, who were drowned as a result of the raids. Um, for the D-Day anniversary, 75th anniversary of D-Day, uh, we saw very clearly a celebration. Uh, and again, a, a celebration of, of liberation. But I can remember going back to the 1990s um, the, when, you, when you'd go to Normandy in those days, the French people in some places were pretty hostile. And back in 1993, I was with some French friends and, uh, and said to them, you know, what, what's, what's going on here? Why are these French people so hostile to us? And uh, they said, well, you know, there's an there's old boy in the pub. Why don't you go and ask him? So uh, I went and spoke to this uh, elderly French chap and I bought him a brandy. In fact, two brandies by the time we'd finished. And, um, and I said to him, you know, why, why you know, we, we're brought up with this idea that you're, you're hugely grateful for the fact that British soldiers and Canadians and Americans turned up and, and liberated you from the Germans. Why is it that 
you are clearly quite hostile to us to us now you know I, I just don't understand it and he said uh, what you need to understand is that for the best part of four years we'd lived in perfect peace and harmony with the Germans our daughters and girlfriends or daughters and and and, and the girls amongst us had, had, had gone out with Germans they'd married Germans um, Germans bought things in our shops uh, there was very little crime because the Germans dealt with it very, very quickly. And then you turned up and you destroyed all our houses. You killed a lot of my friends. And in that moment, I completely understood that your version of history will depend entirely on where you happen to be standing when you witness it. And there is no such thing as the definitive version. In fact, years later, I was talking to... Uh, to four veterans of the 1st Battalion Suffolk Regiment who'd all landed on D-Day at the same time in the same place. One of them was adamant, absolutely adamant, that the Germans had armoured cars in Colville as they came ashore or Wistrom or wherever it was. Uh, the other three were equally adamant that they didn't. Now, is that because one of them's right and three are wrong? Is it because three are right and the other one's wrong? Or is it because as they crossed the road, one of them looked to his left and saw an armoured car and the other three looked to the right and didn't? And this is the problem with with, uh, certainly it's a problem with veteran testimony, as, as anybody that interviewed veterans will know. But it also means that you have to question, you have to look for a lot more, um, a lot more facts and figures. You have to interview a lot more people. You have to look at unit diaries and histories and newspaper reports and all sorts to really start to build up a much bigger picture. But also use some common sense, because very often that's another thing that's simply missing. When you look at a situation, just look and say, well, they've done something which I think is stupid all these years later, but actually at the time, it might well have made perfect sense. And when you start thinking about these things very often, you will understand the answer and you will see exactly why they did what they did. There's quite a per perception that the British Army were hopelessly unprepared for the First World War. But as you've heard in several of the other talks that we've given in this series, the South African War, the Boer War, had taught a huge amount of lessons to the British Army. And by the time that the First World War breaks out, the British Army has been completely and utterly reorganised from top to bottom. There's now a general staff, a management committee, if you like, who are looking after all the organisation. There's people in charge of logistics, in charge of training, all aspects. The uniforms, the equipment, the weaponry have all been upgraded. The standards of training have been upgraded. Um, it's probably true to say that the, that the uniforms and equipment and uh, certainly the, the sort of basic soldier kit was probably state-of-the-art compared to virtually everybody else in Europe at that time. But what the British Army didn't have were numbers. The British Army was absolutely tiny compared to nearly all of the European countries. So because British didn't have conscription, it meant that on the outbreak of war, uh, the British Army was a, probably a, you know, 150,000 strong was the, was the maximum amount that the British could send overseas, uh, certainly to, to, to Europe as part of the British Expeditionary Force. But more importantly, it also meant that before the war, there hadn't been the numbers, let alone the space in this country, to do mass manoeuvres. So the opportunities that the French, that the Germans had had to do these huge exercises, these huge field day manoeuvres, uh, was something that the British simply hadn't had the opportunity to do. So they were always going to have to learn on the job. That is not to say that the British weren't prepared for the war. They were certainly well and truly prepared. In fact, the, uh, in the years leading up to the war, it had been identified that the old system whereby a soldier had to pretty much sign up for, for 12 years uh, as a sort of a standard was something that had deterred an awful lot of soldiers from joining the army. Um, but it was also a tricky thing because if they signed on for less, it was difficult because if you were sending troops to India, it meant that they'd only been there probably for a few years and then they'd be coming home again, which uh, in the end, they, they come up with a system of, um, of serving for a number of years as a regular soldier and then spending a number on reserve. So you could sign up for 12 years straight and you probably wouldn't reach the dizzy heights of corporal, let alone sergeant, if you hadn't shown that commitment. But what it meant was that you could sign up for uh, three years as, a, as a, a regular and nine on the reserve, nine and three, seven and five, five and seven. All of those options um, meant that you could, uh, could pretty much pick and choose how much soldiering you wanted to do. But that reserve service meant that you were still uh, likely to be called up at any point in the event 
that a European war kicked off. In fact, at the Suffolk Regiment Museum, we have all the paperwork of a soldier called Bill Hayward. And Bill's a great example. He joins up in 1905 or 1906. He's done his few years of soldiering. He leaves the army and he's almost out of his reserve service when the Great War breaks out. And amongst the collection is the telegram uh, where he's called up for service. And there's also the telegram that he sends home to his wife, which says, I've arrived at Bury St Edmunds, I've met up with my old mates and I've had a haircut. He then went into the, the building which, uh, which, which now houses the Suffolk Regiment Museum, the headquarters of the Royal Anglian Regiment, which in those days was the reservists clothing store and armoury. And he would have gone up the steps at one end, walked along the counter, come out with an armful of kit, gone back to a barrack room, assembled it all, um, and later in the day gone and drawn a rifle. And the thing to remember is that the, between the time that Bill Hayward left the army and the time that the Great War broke out, the equipment had changed. So he's now been issued with a set of 1908 pattern equipment, which if you watch one of our previous talks, you'll know all about. Um, but he's never seen this before. So he has to learn how it all goes together, how it all works. Um, he's issued with the short magazine, the Enfield Rifle. And again, the last time that Bill Hayward was in the army, he was using uh, the, the long Lee Enfield, which had been converted to charger loading. So a very, very different, you know, different weapon to handle, even though the principle's the same. However, within the space of two days, the Suffolk Regiment have completely equipped all of their reservists, and those reservists have either been sent over to Curragh Camp Dublin, um, or were held at the depot um, and would later join the 1st Battalion when they arrived back from the Sudan. It was an extraordinary undertaking. Within the space of two days, the peacetime army, which in Europe, the, those uh, battalions on home service ran at pretty much half strength. Within a couple of days, They'd been brought up to full strength, uh, a whole fighting battalion, best part of a thousand men, uh, equipped and um, armed, and were in the process of, of getting back up to speed again, ready to go to France. That was happening literally all over the country. Every regimental depot, every cavalry depot, every artillery barracks, the engineers, you name it, everywhere were bringing their units back up to strength, ready for overseas service. It was a truly staggering undertaking, uh, let alone the fact that all of this kit was sitting there ready and waiting for them. And there were still stocks, because even when the, uh, the, the, the first of the new armies, the Kitchener Volunteers start arriving, there's still enough to kit out pretty much most of that first 100,000 men, at least with basic khaki uniforms before the khaki surge runs out. The actual mobilisation process itself, the, the transport to then get those troops from their barracks, from their stations, in the case of Second Suffolk, they were at Curragh Camp near Dublin. Uh, they get on a boat, they, get, uh, they, they, they cross the, the Irish Sea, get on a train down to, to Southampton, where they then get on, a, 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 get, get on a boat and head for France. The trains leaving Waterloo Station were incredibly efficient. Every train carrying half a battalion, it took next to no time to load it, straight away another, uh, and it's, it's obviously half a battalion of men, it's their wagons, it's their food, it's their ammunition, it's, it's their horses, it's everything that they need. Get them loaded up, get them off, get them down to Southampton, loaded on a ship and away. It was extraordinary, and for the length of that period of mobilisation, not a single man was delivered in the wrong place, not a single train was late. It was an extraordinary piece of logistical you know it really was a piece of logistical magic and it all just worked it was quite extraordinary all planned out long before the war every single unit had their own mobilization documents uh, every time that the, that particular unit moved from place to place it was tweaked it was altered to suit their particular surroundings uh, or their particular circumstances and it all just kicked off and as i say everything pretty much went just according to plan Obviously, they then arrive in France, and the, the fact that they have had little opportunity to, to get all these men up to strength really makes a major difference, because despite the fact that the British Army per se is incredibly well equipped, it's very well trained, almost half the men who go to France are reservists who've been called back. And that means that they're out of practice. They haven't been firing on the range for sometimes years, anything up to eight years in some cases. Uh, they've all got brand new boots on the feet which need breaking in so they're struggling to march. 
Uh, and it's not surprising that when they do finally bump into the German army, that they struggle. And, um, and despite the fact that the British official history talks about the Germans uh, claiming that every British soldier had had machine guns, it's pretty obvious that Jack Sheldon has now pretty much disproved all that. And, uh, and the British army pretty much took a, quite a battering until well after the retreat from Mons had finished and the advance to the Ain had started. So it was a very well equipped army. It was a very well trained army, but there weren't enough trained soldiers and it was far too small to be able to take its place on a European battlefield, take on a major European army and defeat them in next to no time. Certainly it was never going to be over by Christmas. Um, so that's pretty much sets the scene as, as to how, how the uh, how the British Army finds itself in France. Um, the equipment itself, as I said, was state of the art, uh, no doubt about it. You've seen in other films that we've made how the British rifle was a better battlefield rifle than the German Mauser, uh, had a higher capacity and a much better action, which meant that you never needed to take your eye off the target. And the training of the pre-war regular soldiers meant that those men certainly knew how to do a lot of damage with it. And again, it was simply lack of numbers. There just wasn't enough of them to make a difference against such an enormous army. As, as I say, the British, at the beginning of the Great War, they can put probably 150,000 men onto the battlefield. On the first day, the Germans are in a position to have over 3 million men, uh, trained men on the battlefield almost straight away. So it was, it, as I say, it was never ever going to be over by Christmas. Um, the generals, the people who ran the army, again, a much maligned bunch, um, and one of the common gripes about those, uh, the, 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 those officers is that they were completely and utterly isolated from what was going on in the front line, that they lived in chateau, far behind the lines. But again, it's all about context, isn't it? You know, they, they, yes, they did. They, they did operate from chateau. But it wasn't just a luxury apartment. The reason that they were in Chateau is simply because as a general, you were a brigadier general running an infantry brigade, uh, you were a major general running an infantry division, you were a lieutenant general running an army corps or a general you know, running an army or the field marshal right at the top running the whole thing. Um, and all of those organizations were large organizations. The headquarters of a brigade or a division or a corps needed staff. You had meteorological officers, you had gas officers, artillery officers, staff officers, there were clerks, there needed to be cooks, there were grooms, uh, you know, drivers. All of these people needed somewhere to work from. They needed somewhere to sleep. They needed places to eat. You cannot possibly run an infantry brigade in a tiny little French hovel with the roof off. You just can't. You needed to have somewhere big enough to do that. And Chateau were the ideal places to run those organisations. And in any case, the very last thing you need is, is for the people who are trying to run these organisations, the people right at the top, to be so close to the front line that they only get the tiniest, narrowest view. They need to be far enough back that they can see the bigger picture. There are plenty of people in the front line who can feed that information back to them. But when an attack starts, when they launch an attack, they need to be far enough back to see where it's being successful to then reinforce the success, or if it's being unsuccessful, then to, to switch troops or to make a decision to then switch them somewhere else where they're going to be able to, to, to make, a, you know, make a real difference. So it's important that they keep far enough back to do that. But again, when it's all simplified down into, oh, generals, they had a posh place to live, then it's not surprising that people malign them. People think that they were incapable and, uh, and, and were out of touch. Um, but of course, in reality, most of them had fought, if not in the earlier parts of the First World War, then certainly in other wars, in the Boer War or, or in other, other actions around the world before. So it's very easy to simplify these things. It's very easy to, uh, to, to say that, uh, oh, all the generals all die in bed. But of course, the reality is that there's pretty much one general killed or, or injured for every week of the war. Um, and that experience, that knowledge and experience, we, they, they, just, they didn't need to lose it. It was too important to lose. And the idea that a, a brigadier general is standing in full view of the German army, waving a map around, deciding where he's going to site his command post uh, and gets himself shot through the head is, is completely wasteful. 
uh, it, it was a foolish thing to do and uh, and but but certainly that that was the reality of it there was an awful lot of them killed leading from the front or or killed certainly because they were you know, they were in places of danger and then of course there's the tactics um you know who thinks advancing into heavy machine gun fire carrying a lot of heavy weight is a good idea especially if you're walking duh well none of you do but why did they do that and of course the reality is that there was a reason there was always a reason and the fact is that the equipment that they were carrying was heavy now it wasn't particularly heavy to them because they wore most of it every day they were used to it but before an attack they would be loaded up with a couple of grenades they'd have extra rifle ammunition they'd have a pick or a shovel perhaps they'd have an extra gas mask and it all adds they could run in it they could easily run in it they were trained for it you know the fellas were you know 18 to 40 odd year old fellas who had been trained could easily run in it however from the moment they get out of their trenches it's nearly always advancing uphill it's nearly always advancing over broken ground and by the time they get to the german trenches having run all that way at that point they then need to jump into that german trench and start fighting blokes hand to hand who haven't even broken into a sweat yet and at that point who's going to win the germans so the decision is much more sensible to advance across no man's land at a fairly steady walk to get within a certain distance of the german trenches the entire line stops kneels down fixes bayonets and charges the last bit with lots of aggression so they've still got lots of energy when they actually make that attack it was a perfectly sensible thing to do but when you strip it back and just say oh they were walking across no man's land then it sounds ridiculous unless you have the context unless you understand what the reasoning was behind it they also had things to limit the damage the techniques the uh, as they come out of the trench they were trained to go into what was called extended line so as you come out of the trench the gap between you you, you, you train you, you rehearse all this so as you come out you open the gaps two paces three paces four paces between you between each soldier the second wave several paces behind staggered in the gaps and so on and so on the heavier the machine gun fire the wider the gaps and this had all been rehearsed and what that meant is that German Maxim machine guns firing 600 rounds a minute where are most of those bullets going to go through the gaps they just do of course some people are going to get hit no doubt about it the whole reason for building trenches is to keep below the ground where it's safe the minute you get out of the trenches you're exposed and people are going to start getting killed or wounded but they had found ways of mitigating that damage of reducing the amount of casualties it had always fascinated me how come they didn't all get killed and of course the answer was because they had come up with these techniques to reduce that potential damage on the 1st of July 1916 the British army attack on the Somme at half past seven in the morning in broad daylight in agreement with the French the French say this is the time the attack goes in and the British had to agree and off they went at half past seven in the morning needless to say a huge amount of men were killed in fact the, the worst day in British military history um, 60,000 casualties um, of which 19,000 of them are dead I mean that's an enormous number of people later in the battle in the September there's the successful capture of the area around the chateau at Thiepval on 26th of September and for that attack the attack goes in at half past two well it, it, between tw uh, half past 12 in the afternoon which also seems ridiculous still in broad daylight but what they'd learned from the 1st of July is that if you attack at half past seven in the morning by early afternoon you've run out of steam the whole attack grinds to a halt everything slows right down you reach the stage where fellas have just they, they just need to rest and you've then got all the rest of the hours of daylight for the germans to counterattack. you can't become bring up any supplies you can't get rid of the wounded you can't bring up any water you can't bring up any more men until it's dark whereas if you attack in the early afternoon you run out of steam at dusk then you have all the hours of darkness to do all of that to bring up your supplies to, to bring up more men to get rid of the wounded you can re, you know, build, build up the defenses you, you can be prepared for the Germans they can't see you in the dark and when they attack you at first light they just bounce off so it's all part of that learning process all the way through there are lessons being learned on both sides try something doesn't work try something else every step of the way people are going to get killed in order to learn those lessons but the lessons do get learned 
Back in 2006, I took a team of people over to Canada. We had to train 140 young Canadians who'd had relatives who'd served in the Canadian Army in the First World War, and we had to train them to be First World Canadian soldiers. And it was blazing hot at the time we were there, so at some point um, we'd taken them off into the woods one afternoon to, to do a bit of training, and then we stopped and did a, a lecture a bit like this. And at some point, one of these Canadian lads said to me, you don't understand, 70,000 Canadian soldiers died in the Great War. I said, I do. You know, the 60,000 British soldiers killed or wounded in one day in 1916. I, I get it, you know. And actually, of those Canadian soldiers, one of them who was killed was related to me, so I, I do understand. I said, but, um, but look at it like this. Um, using a modern analogy, the, the Canadians at the end of the Korean War said never again. From here on in, the Canadian Army are just going to be peacekeepers. We're going to wear our blue berets, our blue helmets, join, you know, and, and just do United Nations peacekeeping and keep the warring sides apart. And ever since then, that's pretty much what they've done. However, by the time we were in Canada in 2006, the Canadians had agreed with the Americans that, uh, that they would offer some help in Afghanistan and the Canadians had sent troops and by the time that we were, that we were over there, uh, 17 Canadians had been killed in action in Afghanistan. And it was very raw because a lot of the people that we were working with knew the men who'd been killed. So I said to them, what's peace and democracy in Afghanistan worth? Is it worth 17 dead Canadians? Is it worth 170 dead Canadians? 1,700? 1 1.7 million? What's it worth? What was the, you know, wind the clock back. What was the capture of Vimy Ridge worth? What, the, the landing in Normandy, the wind the clock back even further, the, the, the Battle of Waterloo. What was it worth to bring to an end the Napoleonic Wars? And the fact is, there is no answer to it. Twice in the last century, the German army tore up the rule book and fought total war. Whatever it takes to win, that's what we'll do. And when you decide to fight people like that, you have to fight as long as they're prepared to fight and a bit longer, as hard as they're prepared to fight and a bit harder, or you will lose. There's nothing else. And that's what made people like Sir Douglas Haig the right man for the job. When their intelligence officer comes in and says, there you go, chief, last few days fighting, 120,000 casualties, he could look at that, weigh it up in his mind and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's not too bad. Go ahead, do that again tomorrow. Nowadays, most of you would say, ooh, that's too expensive. And you'd lose. And that's the inevitable conundrum. We look back at the Great War, and nowadays, it has become just about dead blokes. In this country, certainly, it's just about memorials. That most throughout most of the centenary, most of it was telling the story of men who'd been killed. And 11% of those who went off to war were killed. But 89% of them came home again with remarkable stories. Men and women who'd achieved incredible things and made amazing leaps in medical science, in warfare, all sorts. And the trouble is, if we only ever concentrate on that very, very narrow band of people who are killed, all of those other stories never get told. We see this time and time again with the media when they make documentaries or dramas. They pretty much always tell the same story with a slightly different theme. Because once you've got yourself absolutely convinced that the First World War was all a waste of time, it was all about mud and blood and everybody gets killed for nothing. Once you've created that little tiny ball, if you can't break out of it, then all of those other stories that don't fit that particular description, you can't make them. But if you break out of that, then you can tell the extraordinary stories. And those people that came home at the end of the war certainly deserve to have their voices heard as well, because they had some remarkable stories to tell. And also the, the image that we have of the Great War as just one big muddy, four year long, rainy, muddy war with, uh, with, with endless misery, it needs challenging too. When you spoke to veterans, you know, the, the thing that always surprised me was sometimes they'd say to you, you know, well, you think 
that a lovely hot sunny day is it would be the best thing when you're stuck in a trench but actually a blazing hot sunny day when you have to wear your uniform your equipment your steel helmet all of the time it just saps your strength there's nothing you can do to cool down but if it's a bit cold if it's slightly drizzly you can move around you can warm up it's counterintuitive it's not what we think it's all about context isn't it it's about understanding and putting is trying to put yourself in a different position in a place that you literally couldn't understand and trying to get your head around the world that they lived in it's a very popular thing for for school parties to um to to use handling kit to to try on soldiers equipment and helmets and pick up rifles and this is something that that i've often done with uh, with, with teachers they say okay you know, I, I bet that you do this don't you but you use handling kit all the time and they say oh yeah yeah it's brilliant okay so let me just try something so yeah if you wouldn't mind will you put this helmet on you know yeah okay what can you tell me about that oh it's heavy okay and right you put the equipment on what can you tell me about that oh it's heavy okay but you, if you like the rifle what can you tell me about that oh it's heavy okay so what we've just learned is that everything that a first world war soldier had was heavy but it wasn't heavy to him because he wore it all the time it wasn't heavy at all and without that context it's very very easy to draw the wrong conclusion time and time and time again poets are a good example um, there were some brilliant first war poets there's no doubt about it i mean uh, people like w wilfred owen no doubt was was a poet first and foremost and a soldier second but there have been so many times where i found myself uh, you know discussing this with quite heatedly with, with english teachers who say yes but the poets tell us so much and i said well they don't really they tell us a very 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 tiny tiny fragment they really do and i said if you think about it like this there were 6.7 million british men and women who served in the armed forces during the first world war so as an analogy if you view the british experience of the great war as a jigsaw puzzle then your puzzle's got 6.7 million pieces so let's start picking a few up let's pick up the poets you know what have you got 30 40 50 of them if you're really generous and include the ones that most people have never heard of if you look at those 50 jigsaw pieces does it show you the whole picture no it can't it can't possibly do that and that is the reality that it's very very easy to take these tiny fragments and blow them up and say well this is a typical experience of everybody but it just wasn't the experience of soldiers at different points of the war of, of different types of soldiers were very very different i mean throughout the war you have pre-war regular soldiers who joined for for a career they were they were professional soldiers they had a very very different outlook on soldiering they to them they, they would they weren't bothered in 1914 if the british government had said go and shoot frenchmen or belgians or, or anybody that, that that's what they did it was it was purely business off they'd have gone to europe and, and fought a war no matter who the opposition were the territorial force were pre-war um, part-timers um Kitchener and, and Field Marshal Lord Roberts had no time at all for the territorial force. They thought they were a complete waste of time. They were a bunch of amateurs and they'd never expected to go to war. They, uh, it, the pre-war, they were never, ever intended to do anything other than uh, be um, for home defence. So they had a very, very different attitude than the pre-war regulars. When the Kitchener volunteers arrive in late 1914, that changes completely because suddenly the British Army has an injection of all sorts of people including a lot of very very bright people a lot of white collar workers many of them who hadn't been driven by king and country at all it wasn't about patriotism most of them were simply bored with their day jobs and looking for some adventure but they were very literate there was a lot of very very bright people amongst them and some of the best accounts that we have of the first world war have been left by men who joined up as kitchen volunteers and fought with the new armies and then from 1916 we have the conscripts the people who generally speaking didn't want to go at all and uh, and that's reflected in the fact that there's a lot fewer um, accounts written by them uh, and certainly um, it's also shown in places like uh, regimental museums i know certainly the suffolk regiment museum have a lot more trios the first world war medals the uh, 1914 or 1415 stars and the war medal and victory medals than they do just the pairs 
which was the sort of classic uh, met the medals for, 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 the, uh, for, for the conscripts later, uh, which kind of suggests that the people who joined up, who volunteered, were much prouder of what they'd done and, and very keen to make sure that their medals arrived in the regimental museum rather than the people who were, had to have their arms twisted or, or forced to go later in the war. And the soldiers themselves, I mean, obviously there were 6.7 million men and women. Um, everybody would have had a slightly different view. But one thing that always stuck with me, back in, uh, back in 1992, we were at Passchendaele, and I was talking to Donald Hodge. And Don Hodge, had, uh, he, he'd served with the 7th Royal West Kent. He was a new army volunteer. He joined up in September 1914. And in 1992, he was the president of the First World War Veterans Association. And just after the service at Crest Farm at Passchendaele, as I say, I was just chatting to him. And something I'd said about how it was a shame that the, that the public pitied them, because what a lot of people think is, uh, is being respectful, that a lot of the veterans saw as pitying, that whole, oh, oh, you poor boys, you know, those terrible conditions. You know, and he misunderstood me. He thought I was saying that I pitied him. And he turned around and he poked me, very politely, and he said, don't you pity us? You don't understand the world that we lived in. Most of us worked six day weeks. We had very little pay. We left school when we were 12 or 13. We worked very long hours. They rarely had holidays. Many people's families, you know, by the time they're in their 50s, they ended up in the workhouse with the men or the women split up. And suddenly along came this great adventure. For a lot of people, they had the first new boots they'd ever worn. They had the first new clothes they'd ever worn. They had decent food, they had fresh air, they had exercise. Foreign travel, when would most of them ever have gone abroad? Brilliant mates, great company, and this huge adventure. But the thing he said next was the thing that completely changed the way that I thought about the Great War and the people that fought in it. He said to me, what you'll never understand, as long as you live, is that it can be better to get yourself killed as a 20-something year old than to see an endless life of drudgery stretching ahead of you that you knew you'd never escape from. And none of us, none of us can put ourselves in that position. Around here in Suffolk, in these fields, people, the farm hands would be up at four in the morning They'd water the horses, they'd feed the horses, they'd groom the horses, they'd spend a back-breaking morning ploughing, they'd have their lunch, they'd do the same in the afternoon, reverse the whole process in the evening, get home, a house with no electricity, have something to eat, go to bed, get up the next day and do it all over again. Sunday, day off, oh, go to church, half a day off. They would do that day in, day out, until they were too old, too ill, or too dead to do it again. That's how it was. And nowadays, those same people's houses are now changing hands for half a million pounds. And the people who live in them with their plush carpets and their big widescreen tellies and their double glazing. It's no wonder that we can't put ourselves in the same position and understand them. But that was something that several times I spoke to other veterans and a lot of them said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I felt. Didn't all say that by any means. But it's certainly a fascinating perspective that made me completely rethink and completely reevaluate how I saw them and how I thought about the, the reasons that people might well have joined the army. The other thing that's really important is how the British Army learned its lessons. As I say, both sides learned, of course they did, but all the way through the war, it was a continual learning process. This idea somehow that the that that the British Army did nothing for four years except continually repeat exactly the same tactics, bashing its head against the wall and just keep getting killed until there was nobody left. That, that simply isn't what's happening. All the way through the war, there are lessons being learned. And as I said before, of course it's going to cost lives. Of course it will cost plenty of lives to learn those lessons. But the lessons were learned. The British Army go into the Battle of the Somme, pretty much with the same mentality they'd had throughout the Victorian period. In an infantry battalion, the majority of those infantrymen were, were, were just riflemen. By the time the battle's finished, a lot of those lessons have been learned, and it's really become a modern army that understands how to fight a modern war. Those lessons 
were learnt. They were then distilled into a training pamphlet, the SS143, the, the training of platoons for offensive action, which meant that in an infantry platoon, the four sections, instead of being four sections of riflemen, you had one section who were riflemen and they were the best shots. They could hit the target nearly every time. You had a section of bombers who were the men who could um, who, who could throw a, a Mills bomb and, and get it into a bucket 50 yards away. You then had the rifle bombers who were probably fellows who weren't much good at the first two, but who could then fire a rifle grenade quite some distance and they would either fire grenades or they could fire smoke. So you had just sort of your, your, your portable artillery, if you like. So you were able to, to lay down a barrage of, of grenades or, or of smoke to obscure the battlefield to enable you to advance a bit closer. And then the last section were the Lewis gunners. So you had your sort of portable machine guns with you. And chatting to an old veteran of the Northumberland Fusiliers many years ago, I can remember him saying to me, it was, it was like a ballet formation. He said, we'd learnt this over and over and over again. And he said, in 1918, as we were advancing in the open, it was all open warfare by then, he said, we're advancing this huge diamond formation. And suddenly we come under fire from some Germans at a road junction. And without one word of command, everybody drops to the ground. The rifle bombers start putting down smoke in front of the Germans so they can't see us. They then start dropping grenades on top of them. The Lewis gunners go right out onto one flank and fire across the Germans to keep their heads down and make sure they don't get any help. Then the riflemen and the bombers move in, kill them all off. Then we move on to the next target. And they were trained to attack trenches from one trench to another, to attack trenches end on, to attack pillboxes, you name it. All of that just trained um, so that they knew exactly what to do um, without, as I say, without any, any specific words of command. And pretty much that same training really hasn't changed in over a century. That same platoon training is, is not far off what a, an infantry platoon would do today. And those lessons, the infantry lessons, the artillery lessons, the lessons of, of, of all arms warfare um, with artillery and tanks and aircraft and the infantry and machine guns all working together was something that had pretty much become perfected by the end of the war. Um, as early as the beginning of 1916, uh, during the siege at Kut in Mesopotamia, the RAF were already dropping supplies by parachute to, to the garrison who'd been uh, completely encircled there. So later in the war, they're dropping supplies by parachute uh, to the advancing troops. And I think it's uh, the, 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 the tactics really by the end of the war always surprise people who don't know much about the First World War. The idea that there, there's supplies being dropped by parachute, that creeping barrages, that everything's working together. The assumption is that that's the sort of stuff that was happening in the Second World War, not the first. Um, but the reality is that most of that had been perfected before the end of the First World War. And come the second time around, it took a while for the British Army to relearn some of those lessons. On the logistics side, um, the people who ran the army, people like Sir Douglas Hay, completely got the fact that morale was really, really important. It was important to make sure that soldiers got letters regularly. Um, in fact, um, a family could send a letter from the north of Scotland and it could arrive in a trench a, a few days later. I mean, it was something that the post office probably couldn't do now. It was quite remarkable, the, the, the speed with which those letters were sent and, uh, and, and the way that that whole um, postage operation worked. And food as well. Um, the food wasn't exciting food, it was quite dull, but generally speaking it was pretty good food and certainly it built soldiers up and it gave them all the nourishment and, uh, and all the protein that they needed to do the job. Uh, which again is something which, uh, which very often is derided and people say, oh the food was all terrible and, uh, and, and certainly every soldier has stories of the food being rubbish, but, um, but there are plenty of others uh, which, which show very clearly that what they were getting was pretty good uh, and certainly much better than many of them would have had at home. Um, by 1918, the, the British Army has changed completely. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing like the army that go to war in 1914. The whole of that process all the way through has been one long, constant learning curve. And it's not been a smooth curve, it's been quite a bumpy curve, but every single step of the way, there have been lessons learned. Um, there'd be an action somewhere, a few days later, there would be a report on it, uh, lessons learned at the attack at Highwood, um, 18th of August, 1916, we tried this, it didn't work, don't do it again, what about this, what about that? There was a pooling of knowledge, um, there was sharing information, there were suggestions, there were um, 
units devising their own pieces of equipment and if it was something that worked would very often be taken up and be shared amongst others or, or put into wider production for the whole army. Um, it was very, very, very innovative right the way across the board. Um, and as I say, there's an awful lot of things which, uh, which taken out of context, you'd think, well, that's a, that's a ridiculous thing to do. But once you've got your head around it, you understand why. I mean, um, only a couple of weeks ago, somebody was saying to me, why on earth didn't they stop the Battle of the Somme you know, after the first day when it was obvious all of these people had been killed? But the reality is that one of the reasons for fighting the Battle of the Somme was to take the pressure off the French army at Verdun. And the amount of casualties that the British were taking um, had been completely dwarfed by the size of the casualties that the French were taking regularly during the fight at Verdun. In fact, the, uh, the French army had had their worst day of the entire war back in August 1914, when they'd had more men killed or wounded in one day than the British army suffer at any point during the entire war. And at that stage, the British army hadn't fired a single shot in anger. Um, so it's, it's all about perspective. Um, and again, as I say, one of the problems is that nowadays it has become just about the casualties. It's become just about dead soldiers. But even that, if you put it into perspective, you know, there are 650, 700,000 British soldiers, sailors and airmen who were killed in the First World War. That's an enormous figure and some of them are related to me. So I'm not demeaning that in any shape or form. But to put that into perspective, there are 600,000 German soldiers killed before January the 1st, 1916, before the Verdun, before the Somme, before Arras, before Cambrai, before Passchendaele, before the German March Offensive, before the battles of the last hundred days, let alone whatever's happening on the Eastern Front. The French army lives over a million men, the Russian army probably over a million men. You know, the, uh, the Italians have a terrible time. Uh, so these enormous casualty figures suffered by every army, in nearly every instance dwarf the casualties of, of, of the British army. And yet, wherever you go around the rest of Europe, there, there are none of the other countries in Europe that have this obsession with the fact that everybody's killed in the way that the British do. And that's a, a very, very British thing, I think. It's, uh, it's, always, got to be about the, uh, it's always got to be about the dead. But it's a shame because it, it does obscure so much else about the Great War. Throughout the centenary, an enormous sum of money was put into art and performance, and which was, which was great, which was nice. But in hardly any instance was there any reference to or understanding of the history, which inevitably meant that nearly all of those artworks in some form or other were about commemorating dead men. And again, a missed opportunity. There were so many other things that could have been brought out, so many other stories, so many other uplifting stories, so much about British achievement, real achievement, because the whole process of mobilisation, the whole process of, of the work of the people at home, the, the, the families, all of those things were remarkable stories and remarkable national achievements which could have been brought out and, and could have been celebrated, not just commemorated, instead of focusing on that very, very narrow aspect of the war. And I think it's a shame because a century on, over a century on now, the opportunity really for telling that story is not going to come again anytime soon. And yet, whenever I go and, 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 uh, and spend an hour talking to groups who don't particularly have an interest in the First World War and spend an hour gently um, talking about myths of the Great War and, uh, and, and challenging them, what I find time and time again is that it's pushing on an open door. I keep getting, being told by other people that, oh no, the public won't take any of this, the public, oh no, they only believe this simple view. I don't think that's true at all. In my experience, wherever you go, when you tell people something that they didn't know, then at the end of it, they don't say, you're wrong. They say, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. I'd like to look up. I'd like to read a bit more about that. And they go away and learn something, which has got to be far better than just reinforcing the same old myths time and time again. Anyway, I think I've probably said enough for, the, for this time. Um, I think that uh, certainly by the end of the war, the British Army had completely and utterly reinvented itself many times over and, and had become a, a literally a true war-winning machine. Um, 
in the end, had the war gone on much longer, there's no doubt that it would all have finally crashed and uh, crashed and burnt because it wasn't possible to keep up the rate of advance every day. They were outstripping the supply lines. Um, I have a diary of a soldier of the 4th Suffolk somewhere where day after day, you know, no food today, still no food today, haven't had any food today. You know, oh, we got one piece of black German bread between four of us. Um, and it was quite clear that the quartermasters were prioritising ammunition over food quite rightly. They've got the Germans on the run and they need to keep it that way. But, um, but I think that that story, that story of, uh, of ultimate success and, um, and, and all of those lessons learned and, uh, and real achievement, real, a real proper achievement is something that really does deserve to be told. So a hundred odd years later, it would be great if a few more people knew all about it. Phew! Well, thank you all very much indeed for uh, for tuning in again this month. And uh, I don't know what next month's going to bring yet. We've got um, a message from uh, from the Royal British Legion at uh, at Stowmarket, where the Suffolk Western Front Association have their meetings to say that they are hoping that they'll be able to open again in October. But I don't think that will be until the end of October. So I think that uh, it's almost certain that next month at least there will still be another one of these online meetings and talks. So uh, uh, just just like to say thank you all very much again. And please do, if you haven't already, sign up to the Great War Huts YouTube channel. Uh, it means that you get uh, you get notified any time that we post anything. Uh, and it certainly helps us and, uh, and raises our profile. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, we'd all appreciate it. Thank you very much and we'll see you next month.